Hi, I'm Dr. Thomas Armstrong. I've been asked to make some remarks about neurodiversity and niche construction for your conference, Neuroemergence 2022. So let me just, I'm just going to be uh, having an informal, almost a, you know, conversation with you as I talk about a few things in relationship to niche, niche construction. Now, first of all, I want to say that niche construction was not part of the initial impetus of neurodiversity. This is something that I kind of tacked on to it uh, when I came into uh, knowledge about neurodiversity. And uh, I'm not exactly even sure of when or what um, triggered me to think about the importance of niche construction. Um, but I guess I've been reading in that area um, I subscribed to the New York Review of Books, and one of the progenitors of niche construction, Richard Lewontin Le at uh, Harvard University, now deceased, um, wrote some of his uh, earliest pieces on niche construction, some of the earliest pieces that were written on niche construction. Starting, He started writing in the 1980s, and I read some of these articles in the 90s. And, his point was that, you know, we focus so much on human evolution and the importance of genes when we really ought to add a uh, another aspect to that, and that is the environment. Um, he wrote a book called The Triple Helix, which was in sort of a play on the original double helix model, you know, that uh, Watson and Crick came up with. And he said the third player uh, in this element of of uh, evolution is really the ability of an organism to modify uh, or create its own environment, making an environment uh, easier for it to evolve, essentially. And so uh, several thinkers uh, took on what Lee Wanton had suggested. And the first book that actually came out about niche construction uh, was uh, 2003. Um, by a man named Oddling Dash Smee, a British fellow, uh, and two of his colleagues. And so far, there's not a huge literature out there, but you can go to nicheconstruction.com and uh, find out some uh, of the latest uh, of what's being done in this field. Uh, and it's really fascinating. Now, for those of you that are still kind of awash at what is niche construction, I'll make it very basic, and that is bird's nests an anthill, a spider's web, a beaver dam. These are all environments that different organisms, the ant, the bird, the beaver, the spider, um, have created out of nothing so that they can do what they do best, essentially. You know, the spider to catch his prey. Um, I didn't mention bees. The beehive would be an example of niche construction and so forth. And there's so many other fascinating examples if you go to nicheconstruction.com. But the main point that I got from this was that here's a wonderful model to talk about how we can structure environments for people who are neurodifferent. Uh, neurodiversity is a diversity model. And as such, it's really based, uh, I think, in biodiversity. Uh, I've talked about the brain being more like a rainforest than a computer, and that we need to uh, bring in more um, naturalistic components in order to talk about many of the ideas related to neurodiversity. And niche construction seemed like a, a very appropriate addition to this model. So um, the fir first book that I wrote on, on niche construction or neurodiversity was The Power of Neurodiversity. I'll get to that in a minute. I spent a lot of my time focusing on the classroom and education because I was a classroom, I was a special education teacher for many years. And um, I wrote this book, Neurodiversity in the Classroom. And I spelled out some of the key elements of what I thought uh, key uh, niche construction should be about. And these included seven or eight elements, including becoming aware of one's strengths, having positive role models, using assistive technologies and universal design for learning, uh, using strength-based learning strategies, uh, enhancing one's 
human resource network, uh, creating positive career aspirations, uh, environmental modifications, and finally, inner resources. I'll talk about all these in a minute uh, in a different context, but I just want to say that a lot of my work has been going around teaching teachers how to take those elements and use them uh, for kids that find themselves in special education classrooms. So, um, but in this uh, discussion, uh, presentation, I want to focus on something a little bit different and that's um, actually been emerging for me. Uh, I started to work with it when I wrote uh, The Power of Neurodiversity, uh, but it's been crystallizing. I, I, I taught a course um, for the last two years at a school called the Bridges School for Cognitive Diversity in Education, a very innovative school, which is a graduate school um, uh, awarding master's degrees and doctoral degrees. And I taught a course in neurodiversity. And as I interacted with, the, uh, with my students uh, through papers and through Zoom meetings and so forth, I began to really crystallize around this idea of how niche construction really can make a huge contribution to uh, the mental health field as a wellness model. And part of this came from my own experience as a neurodiverse individual. I have a mood disorder, unipolar depression. Over the course of my life, starting at around the age of 12, I've had five major depressions um, and have you know, really been struggling with um, uh, very serious, I mean, mood disorders are potentially terminal illnesses, if you want to look at it that way, um, because of the suicide risk. And so uh, this has over time gotten more and more of my attention. And I think it was as I struggled with my fifth episode of major depression that I was actually writing the book, The Power of Neurodiversity. And it was, it was a strange time because here I was, in the throes of depression, just negative thoughts, no way of controlling them, it seemed. And here I was writing a chapter on all the positive things about depression. Although in retrospect, I can see how that was probably a good thing for me to be doing, to be focusing on the positive after all. Um, but it was really through my own struggles and through reading and interacting with my students and uh, their own struggles or the struggles of their relatives, their kids, their, their own students, that I began to realize, hey, we've got a wellness model here um, that is much better than the typical, you know, identify the disability or the disease or the disorder and then treat it, diagnose it and treat it, you know, very medical disease-based kind of languages to use when in fact we need much more differentnesses uh, models and diversity models. So I'm just going to go through the uh, seven or eight, actually it's grown now to be about nine or ten interventions um, with uh, its application to a wellness model. And I'll use myself and other people and other instances to illustrate some of these uh, strategies or some of these components. First of all, there's strength awareness. And this is the big one. This is the most important one because, you know, so many of us and so many kids have gotten saddled with negative labels. You know, I, I have done a lot of writing on attention deficit disorder and I've uh, tried to point out that attention deficit hyperactivity disorder has three negatives in it. A, a deficit disorder hyper. You know, those are our three negatives. Um, when in fact, kids with ADHD have all kinds of interesting, novel and eccentric and uh, creative skills. So uh, it's very important for people, let, let me take it to the wellness model, for people who are struggling with depression or um, dealing with socialization as part of being an autistic individual or um, ADHD, dyslexia and so forth, to really become aware as soon as possible of one's strengths and abilities. And not just that, but also once one has a handle on that, to be able to know how to use your strengths and abilities um, in your life, uh, to make your life a more positive experience. Now, I've known for most of my life that um, I'm a word person um, and writing is my thing and reading is my thing. 
And yet it's only been in the past, well, let's just say over the course of several years, I struggled to come to the realization that uh, my work in education was best spent in my office writing rather than in a classroom teaching. Um, I was not a great classroom teacher and part of it was because of my depression. I just didn't have the energy to spend five or six hours in a classroom keeping up with a bunch of kindergartners or first graders or uh, my first two, two years of teaching was actually seventh grade and eighth grade kids in special education. That was really my baptism through fire. And uh, it was just, it was very difficult. It was probably very important for me to go through that. But I just realized this was not my place in the sun. And this is what niche construction is all about. It's about placing, uh, finding a place for yourself in the sun, finding a place that works for you. Um, and so it was over time that I began to realize, you know, what I really love is writing and reading. And this worked perfectly for, you know, what I'd gone through in the classroom and what I wanted to see in education. And so, so far I've written 19, actually 20 books, if you include the novel that I've just written. And um, I should also say that since the age of my mid forties, I have engaged in an adventure in reading that has been unparalleled for me, a great source of my own personal satisfaction and a great thing for someone who, who has been depressed in their life to do. And it was rather interesting that during a major depression, I had no interest in reading. Um, reading is part of what gives uh, pleasure for me. And when I say reading, I'm talking about James Joyce, I'm talking about Virginia Woolf, um, I'm talking about um, Thomas Mann, and Jack Kerouac, and uh, I just finished a book by Willa Cather, Death Comes for the Archbishop. Um, I, I just read a five volume um, epic novel called The Dream of the Red Chamber. It's really one of the greatest novels written in China during the 18th century. It sounds kind of boring, but it is not. It's ab absolutely uh, delightful. So. Becoming aware of your strengths is good and making a list is good, but until you see the relevance of those strengths and you implement them in your own life and you get uh, pleasure from them and they bolster your sense of who you are, that to me is critical. That's why it's so important that we as caregivers um, or teachers or therapists really um, help the individual who is neurodifferent to see their their greatness inside in many different ways. Um, and this is kind of related to positive role models as well. Um, in the autistic field, uh, Temple Grandin has been a great uh, role model for so many people on the spectrum um, because she is a world famous animal scientist and has used her autism as a gift to do what she does best, which is to design cattle machinery so that uh, cattle will not freak out as they're being led to the slaughterhouse. I know that's an issue, but we won't talk about that. Uh, Chris Burke is a great role model uh, for people with developmental and intellectual disabilities. He has Down syndrome and has been an actor and a musician and an advocate and a writer. Um, Henry Winkler has been a great advocate for dyslexia and has written some books for kids about dealing with their trouble with words. So that to me is another part of it also. Surrounding yourself with people who are like you, who have struggled or dealt with the same kind of issues of being in an environment that doesn't understand them and somehow making your mark. Um, if they can do it, then so can I, is really the watchword here. Assistive technologies, that's, that's an important one. The neurodiversity movement itself actually emerged in part because of the internet. Um, the internet made it possible for individuals who have quote unquote socialization problems, which is very debatable. Um, it gave them the chance to interact with each other. Now, one of the difficulties, admitted difficulties of many people on the spectrum is is knowing what other people are intending and reading their cues, reading their faces, their gestures and so forth. Well, none of this is an issue 
on the internet. And so they have a much clearer pathway of communication when they're in a chat room or on a social media platform than if they were face to face in a room somewhere. So in this case, um, using assistive uh, technology was vital to them finding themselves, finding their voice and advocating for their needs, creating a whole movement in the process. Um, there's also, I mean, there's a whole range of assistive technologies and UDL tools to use. Um, everything from uh, speech to text software for the individual who has trouble getting their ideas on uh, down on paper uh, or even on a typewriter, they can simply speak into the computer. Um, Proloco to go for people with communication uh, difficulties can have the computer say the speech sounds for them. And this has opened up communication for a lot of people on uh, with severe communication uh, difficulties um, who are on the spectrum. Human resource networks. This is really a big one too, especially for individuals who have where the emotions and social interaction are a key uh, obstacle to them and a key um, ingredient for breaking out into success for in on their terms. So, um, you know, for me with a mood disorder, it's been uh, finding the right therapist, you know, um, which has not been an easy thing. It's easier said than done. And I've been in the course of my, well, I started in therapy probably when I was in my 20s, uh, 23, 24. I'm 71 now. Um, I've had some good, great therapists. I've had some good ter therapists. And I've had a few terrible therapists. I mean, actually, uh, psyche damaging therapists. So, and fortunately, those have receded into the past and I've healed uh, largely from the, those experiences. But still, you know, um, they, uh, having a therapist to work out things with or being in a group therapy situation um, or having a friend network, very key to individuals with depression. I mean, social isol isolation has been seen as one of the major contributors, not, not just to depression, but to dementia and to a variety of other ills. And so, you know, putting together, if you're a caregiver or a parent or a mental health professional, really thinking about an individual's whole social network, both the positives and the negatives, um, even making a map of it. You can do this thing called a sociogram where you put the person in the middle of the paper and then you kind of branch out and put all their connections and make notes about whether they're positive or negative connections. Like the bully in a person's life would be a negative connection. The best friend would be a good connection. Uh, there might be neutral connections. The grandparent that someone um, that, that read to them and helped them with their reading, that would be part of the resource network. And I think it's important to get that down on paper to look at how it exists right now. And then the next step is what can we do to enhance it? How can we help that individual lose some of the friends that are not so helpful to their flourishing, um, gain new for friends, more healthy friends? How can we bring in professionals to specifically address issues, coaches, therapists, um, and so forth? and uh, relatives um, who are, you know, positive connections and so forth. Positive career aspirations. Uh, I talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, this is finding, this is really, you know, we talk about focusing on kids' disabilities and then everybody kind of talks about the kid and says, oh, I don't know what's going to happen when they graduate. It's going to be horrible. And when they create that kind of negative cloud over the kid's head, makes it all that much more difficult for them to find success on their own terms. So positive uh, career aspirations is starting early, you know, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, with letting the child know that there are gifts that they have that people out in the real world want. And over time, this process can evolve so that by the time they graduate from school, they can have a better sense of who they are so they don't end up so that the kid who is labeled ADHD and needs to move to learn and move to work isn't saddled with a nine to five desk job, for example, which is all too often the case. Um, in my own case, you know, I found out that um, that, like I said, that classroom teaching was not my best 
uh, match in terms of what I did best uh, and what I loved most. Now, I loved and am passionate about children and their welfare and teenagers and their welfare and adults and their welfare. And I love to write and read. So a career as a writer, and I should also say a big part of my career has been speaking um, all over the world in about 30 countries. And I've derived a great deal of satisfaction and I've been able to use what gifts I have. And I tell people, you know, it's a good thing that I was successful doing this because if that hadn't worked out, you know, I'm not really good, much good at anything else. And I, I'm not sure that I would have been very successful in a career where I had to show up for work every day. That kind of leads up uh, to the next component, environmental modifications. And um, I discovered that, you know, speaking was a challenge uh, in terms of flying. I don't like to fly in terms of working with a lot of people intensely, um, you know, coming up afterwards and having face to face conversations. It was stressful, but it only happened once in a while. And I was able to learn de-stressing techniques, um, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, so it turned out I could do that well. But what I really found out was that I'm best off working at home. That is my environment that really is the low stress environment that I do best in. And actually, when I had, I think it was my second major depression, which caused me to drop out of uh, Carleton College in Minnesota, um, what I did was I moved to Massachusetts and I had a home typing business. Again, the words. I type people's uh, dissertations at Harvard and at MIT. Um, but they brought their work to me um, in my home and I had, you know, no fixed. Well, I had deadlines, but there wasn't somebody over my shoulder um, or some boss that I had to uh, placate all the time. And this really this low stress environment for me is an environmental modification of the highest importance. Let's go on to the next one. Uh, the next component of niche construction. This is uh, inner resources. This is an important one, and I didn't write about it in e either of my books. I discovered this in the course of, I think, preparing for my course at uh, Bridges Graduate School. And I realized, you know, we need to empower individuals with things that they can do internally to help them function better in life. And fortunately, we have a lot of these kind of technologies now. Um, one of the most important is um, helping individuals develop a growth mindset instead of a fixed mindset. Uh, research from Stanford University suggesting people do much better when they think, if I work at it, I can get better at it. Whereas if they think, I was born with this, I'll just have to, you know, accept fate, you know, and, and uh, devil come the hindmost. So um, that is important. Um, mindfulness meditation, I found to be a huge component of my own niche. Um, I started meditating about uh, 30 years ago, again, in response to a major depression. I'd gone to a place called Pocket Ranch, which did a lot of therapy um, uh, and uh, a lot of growth techniques, like writing about our families and so forth. Um, and I learned meditation from someone who was there, and I started to do it. And then I took a course from Jack Cornfield. Some of you may have heard of him. Uh, not the chicken soup for the soul guy. That's Canfield. Cornfield is, he's, Jack Cornfield is a guy who's done this wonderful work with mindfulness meditation. He studied as a Buddhist monk in Thailand, and then he got his doctorate in psychology, became a psychologist here in the US. And I took a course from him, a uh, 12 week or 10 week course, and I started to meditate. And I tended to, to um, lapse over time. But when I had my last major depression, which was 13 years ago, I s said, I can't, I can't get sloppy anymore. I've got to start doing this on a regular basis. So I have, and I'd like to think that it was a part of the reason why I haven't had a relapse. And there's some research out there saying that people who do mindfulness, who have had multiple depressions are less likely to have a re relapse. Um, if they do regular mindfulness meditation. Another important inner resource is self-regulation techniques, which of which mindfulness is one piece, one part of that. Um, but other aspects, um, 
involve identifying what you're feeling. That's that's a that's a skill. Some people don't know what they're feeling and how can they do anything about it if they don't know what they're feeling? And then being able to come up with strategies uh, to deal with, you know, anger or frustration or uh, loss or anxiety, um, having a tool like meditation or taking a deep breath or knowing to leave a room when you know you're about to punch somebody in the nose. Um, or thinking a positive thought or having a positive visualization. There are a lot of different uh, self-regulation strategies out there. And so, you know, the field is wide open for a rich um, niche to be constructed with those elements. Finally, and this isn't e in either of the books, either of the books either, um, biological interventions, which is a really important issue, um, especially for me with unipolar depression, I fought against having antidepressants for years and years. Uh, my father had been depressed for many years. He didn't work for about 17 years. They had him on Thorazine, which was um, all that they had really to work with back in the 50s and 60s. But it was kind of like trying to fix a carburetor with a heavy um, mallet or you know a sledgehammer, that kind of thing. Um, and it turned him into a kind of a zombie. And I saw that and I never wanted that to happen to me. So I fought against it. But interestingly enough, in the mid 90s, when I was writing a book on the myth of the ADHD child, which was 50 ways to improve your child's attention span and behavior without drugs, labels or coercion, I happened to have an episode of major depression. Well, maybe, maybe it was minor depression. I'm not sure. But... Sorry, a phone call came in and I am not going to take it because it's probably a telemarketer. At any rate, um, so what was I talking about? Um, I was talking about my depression and my fighting antidepressants. And actually, I had an episode of minor depression where I went to Europe with a lot of stress and I didn't sleep for five days. I mean, literally, I gave a five day workshop on one hour of sleep. And when I came back, that was but finally dragged me into the psychiatrist's office and began ha my taking uh, Prozac. And uh, it kept me depression free for almost 20 years. And then it started to slip a little bit and I had another major depression. And uh, finally I had to put together a combination of uh, four different medications, uh, antipsychotic and antidepressant, or two antidepressants, and then trazodone to deal with um, sleep issues. And that has worked, like I say, for 13 years. So medication should always be seen as an important part, but certainly not the only part. And that's been my issue with ADHD, that too many people rely upon the pill. And don't look at all the other wonderful things that are out there to help individuals uh, develop a positive niche. Uh, and I should also mention food here. Food is also a biological intervention. For me, with depression, I've noticed that in the literature that people who are on a Mediterranean diet um, do better, do better and have less depression. And that includes uh, lots of fruits and gr vegetables, grains, legumes, some fish. Although I saw a note yesterday, the day before saying fish may be associated with depression, uh, which was kind of scary to read. Um, but it may be the the. Um, uh, poisons that they've absorbed from the polluted oceans that are causing that. At any rate, that's, I know I've talked for a while here and uh, I think my limit, my time limit is up, but I just hope that I've given you a sense of how we can really think about, you know, the problem is when, when uh, with a neurodiverse child or adult or teen, people just out of kind of human nature tend to focus on the problem. You know, they say, we've got a problem child. We've got a child with a disability. This child has drove us up the wall. And it's always problem, problem, problem. And yet, how many of us are thinking, this child is fine. He just needs an environment around him that can understand him and work with what he does best. And that's how we ought to be thinking. Um, and it's not necessarily an easy question to uh, come up with the right environment. There are all sorts of issues. I mean, money is one limitation, you know, paying for a therapist who charges a hundred and, uh, well, my psychiatrist charges $265. Um, 
but I think you saved me seventeen thousand dollars in uh, roof uh, because you suggested a roofer to me whose bid was way lower than the other one. So you know, I'm not so <laughs> uh, angry about that anymore. Um, but you know, budgetary constraints can be an issue. Um, where the person lives can be an issue. But being aware of the environment means that we're going to put our first emphasis on how do we build the right environment? How do we create the positive niche? How do we build a nest for this individual or a web or a, um, a rich network of connections and resources and techniques and strategies so that they, what they do best can come to the fore. That's really the essence of what I wanted to contribute with you today at this conference. So thank you very much for listening and I hope you all continue to have a wonderful conference. Thanks so much.